Uh, I heard about a husband who got in some big trouble. Uh, I kind of get in big trouble for telling this story, but anyhow, I'm going to say it anyhow. Uh, a husband was in big trouble when he forgot his anniversary, and his wife told him, tomorrow morning, there better be something in that driveway for me that goes from zero to 200 in two seconds flat. <laughs> and the next morning, the wife found a small package in the driveway. She opened it up, and she found a brand-new bathroom scale. I don't, I don't write them, I just read them. <laughs> but I can say this, the funeral arrangements for that husband have been set at Saturday for 11 a.m. You know, since the first of the year, we've been in a series called Lord Change Me. And we've been talking about making some changes that last. And sometimes some of the truths that we encounter, we don't always want to face. We don't always want to acknowledge. And this is the last message in the series uh, this morning. And before we dive into it, I just want to do a quick review on uh, where we've been. Some of you are going to recognize this. Some of you who are brand new over the last few weeks or today in particular, it's the first time you're going to be seeing it. But let, let me just kind of, kind of walk you through where we've been. The metaphor for this series has been an iceberg. And glaciologists say that only 10% of an iceberg is seen above the waterline. And that 10% in this series, we have said, represents our behaviors how we act. But just under the surface of the water, supporting our behaviors, our emotions. Driving our emotions a little further down the iceberg are our thoughts, how we think, what we think about. At the very bottom of the iceberg, the heart of the iceberg, if you will, are beliefs. And those beliefs can be categorized in three areas public statements, what we want people to think we believe, private convictions, what we think we believe, but it may not be the case, and then core convictions, which are always what we demonstrate that we believe. And the point of the iceberg is this, false beliefs lead to inaccurate thinking, which lead to unhealthy emotions, which lead to destructive behaviors. So we've been talking about how to make some lasting changes in our life. And lasting change comes about when we deal with the issues below the surface, below the behaviors, below the emotions, below the thoughts, and down to our core beliefs. We also introduced something called the Ten Commandments of Lasting Change. So I want to quickly walk you through these Ten Commandments of Lasting Change. Number one, all behavior is based on a belief. Behind every sin is a lie that I'm believing. Number three, change always starts in the mind. Number four, to help people change, we must change their beliefs first. Number five, to change what people believe, we have to change what they care about. Number six, trying to change people's behavior without changing their beliefs is a waste of time. <clears throat> the Bible term for changing a person's mind is repentance, metanoia, changing what you think about. Number eight, we don't change people's minds. The applied word of God does. Number nine, changing the way I act is the fruit of repentance. And number 10, to produce lasting life change, you must enlighten the mind, engage the emotion, and challenge the will. Now, for those of you who've been around the last few weeks, does any of that look familiar to you? Nod your head. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate that. For some of you who've not seen that before, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to some of these messages. I had a lady tell me last night, she said, I really believe this is the most important series that, that you've ever done. And I, I agree, it's really important material to help us begin to look at ourselves, to look beyond surface spirituality, surface appearances, and get down at the bottom of the iceberg. So you can go to journeychristian.com, you can listen, you can watch previous messages in the series, and I encourage you to do that. Today, as we wrap up this series, we are going to talk about establishing a rule of life that will allow us to maintain the changes that God is doing in us and through us. Now, let me say this. A lot of people hear the word rule and they don't like it. I don't like rules. I don't like people to tell me the rules I need to live by. 
Don't be intimidated or put off by the word rule. The word rule comes from the Greek word for a trellis. A trellis is a tool that enables a grapevine or other things that grow, a rose bush, for example, to get off the ground and to grow upward and become more productive and more fruitful. In the same way, a rule of life is like a trellis that helps us abide in Christ and be more spiritually fruitful and emotionally healthy. Having a trellis or a rule to grow by to intentionally keep us moving upward and forward is the difference between trying and training. People who have written about spiritual formation through the centuries have come to realize there's an enormous difference in trying to do something and training to do something. So, so often when we hear good teaching or we hear good preaching about following Jesus, we leave thinking, I'm going to try harder this week to be more like Jesus. And so you hear a good sermon on patience and you say, I'm going to try to be more patient. And then your three-year-old drops your new iPhone in the toilet <laughs> or your teenager wrecks your car or your wife buys you a new bathroom scale. <laughs> How'd that work for you? Trying can only take you so far. Training involves arranging your life around certain practices that will enable you to do what you cannot do by willpower alone. Let me say that again. That's an important statement. Training involves arranging your life around certain practices or a rule or a trellis to grow by that will enable you to do what you cannot do now by willpower alone. You see, spiritual transformation is not a matter of trying harder. It's a matter of training wisely. It's not a matter of trying harder. It's a matter of training wisely. The Bible is very, very familiar with the concept of training. The apostle Paul encouraged his young understudy in the ministry named Timothy. He said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, train yourself to be godly. This thought also lies behind his advice to the church at Corinth. He said, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. You know, sometimes my wife will say to me, John, why do you use so many sports analogies in your messages? Why can't you use something the rest of us can understand like bargain shopping? And in reality, that's why Melinda married me, because she can't resist anything that's 50% off. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. <laughs> Melinda and I met at a travel agency. I was the last resort. <laughs> okay, I'm done with that now. Here we go. I say to her, honey, I, when I use sports analogies, I'm just being biblical. You want me to be biblical, don't you? You see, athletics was a familiar theme in the pages of Scripture, and that's what we see here in 1 Corinthians. Paul's readers in Corinth knew exactly what he meant when he said the games. Corinth was the site of the Isthmian Games, second only to the Olympics in prominence in ancient Greece. It is likely that Paul had been in Corinth during the Ishmian games of 51 AD. And according to one scholar, he may have even made tents because Paul was a tent maker for visitors and contestants needing accommodations. That's an interesting thought to ponder. That a competitor would strive for a crown by simply trying really hard apart from training was unthinkable to Paul. In fact, any athlete who entered the games was required to undergo 10 months of rigid training, and you could be disqualified for failing to do so. So Paul goes on to say in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 9 that he too had entered a life of training so that, he says, after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. 
So from Paul's words here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I think we can better understand the steps of developing discipline, which is the heart of establishing a rule of life. So let's walk through some of these elements today. The first is this, the first step to establishing a rule of life, to establishing some discipline in your life is to develop a strong desire to develop a strong desire. Look at what he writes in verse 24 of 1 Corinthians 9. He says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Paul points out here that most people who compete in a race do so with a desire to win. If you don't want to win, why run the race? No athlete can be successful in any competition unless he or she's willing to pay the price, and they're willing to pay the price because of a strong desire. When I went to college at Cincinnati Christian University, I had the opportunity to play basketball. I had played basketball from fourth grade in elementary school to my senior year in high school. I love basketball. It is my favorite sport. My last game as a senior in high school was the best game I ever played. I made the all-tournament team, and the college coach knew about this, and he tried his best to talk me into playing. But I had to make up my mind if I wanted to pay the price to train, to play again, and I did not. Somewhere along the way, I lost that desire to discipline myself to compete as a well-conditioned athlete so I would have the best chance of winning. I didn't have the want to anymore, and if you don't have a strong desire, you won't do yourself or your team any good because here's a truth that we all need to embrace. Are you ready? We do what we want to do, right? Everybody say that out loud with me right now. We do what we want to do. Turn to the person next to you and say to them, you know, you do what you want to do. (laughs) Now, people say things like this. People say, I want to pray more. You know, if if you really want to pray more, you will. Stop kidding yourself. Other people say, I'd like to serve more. I'd like to give more. Well, if you really want to, you will. You see, we all do what we want to do. The only reason that we don't do more things that will allow us to grow spiritually is because something else comes along that we want to do more. And we get our priorities out of order. The bottom line is we all do what we want to do. There's a story told about an Old West mining prospector who rode his... uh, donkey into this little cowboy town and as he was hitching up his mule a a drunken cowboy staggered out of the saloon and he thought he'd have some fun with his old prospector and the cowboy pulled out his old six shooter and he said oh man i want to ask you something have you ever danced and the old prospector said no son i don't believe i ever have and the cowboy said well i think it's time you learn and he started firing some shots around the old timer's feet and he began to pick up his feet real quick and hop around to avoid the bullets and everybody standing around on the street they got a big laugh out of that but they weren't watching when the old prospector went behind his mule reached behind his saddlebag and pulled out a double barreled shotgun and the cowboy turned around from laughing with the crowd he was looking right down the barrel of that old prospector's shotgun and the old prospector said son let me ask you a question now have you ever kissed a mule The cowboy said, no, sir, but I always wanted to. (laughs) You see, we do what we want to do. Sometimes we just need the right motivation. Paul's point here is that an athlete wants to win. And therefore, we should run the race of faith in Jesus Christ with a desire to win. So a strong sense of desire. Not only should there be a strong sense of desire, second step is needed. We need to develop a sense of direction a sense of direction. Listen to what Paul writes in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 9. He says, therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not run like a man running aimlessly. Paul says, I know where I'm going. I've got a sense of direction in my life. I'm not just wandering around. I'm not just killing time here. You see, any good athlete has a goal. Can you imagine going to a basketball game where there were no baskets, where there were just 10 men dribbling around for 40 minutes? That would be a lot of fun to watch, wouldn't it? Can you imagine going to a track and field event where the starter points his gun in the air and says, now, fellas, you just run wherever you want to. The first one back here in five minutes wins. 
How silly that would be. And yet how many people do you know who have no clue about where they're going in life? No wonder we get sidetracked so easily. Did you know an animal eats when it wants to eat, drinks when it wants to drink, has sex when it wants to have sex, sleeps when it wants to sleep. Animals live impulsively. They are driven by their instincts and urges. But you would be surprised how many people made in the image of an awesome God who live on an animal level every day. They eat when they want to eat. They sleep when they want to sleep. They do what they want to do when they want to do it. They absolutely have no sense of direction in their life. When Paul, the writer of this letter to the church at Corinth, met Jesus Christ on a dusty road outside of Damascus one day, it changed his life radically. It changed his life's focus. He got a new set of ambitions. He got a new set of desires. He got a new sense of direction. And nothing, nothing, nothing was going to prevent him from going after the crown of life made available to him through Jesus Christ. So he would write things like this periodically. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He said at another occasion, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And he says here, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. Let me ask you, can you say that about your life? Where are you going in life? What are you here for? What's your goals? Where do you want to go? I read a book Several years ago, I was a student in Bible college, but the name of the book was called How to Get Control of Your Time and Your Life. And the main message I took away from that book that's really helped me influence about how I use my time is you must take control of your time or someone or something else will. The author said you will be governed by other people's calendars and other people's expectations and other people's schedules and other people's activities and other people's plan for you unless you step up and say, this is where I'm going with my life. This is what God wants me to do. Because listen to me, everybody is going to end up somewhere. We might as well end up somewhere on purpose, right? Strong desire, sense of direction. Thirdly, to develop discipline. You must have a steadfast determination, a steadfast determination. Look at verse 25 where Paul writes, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. The word compete in the original language here means to agonize. Paul is picturing the athletes who agonize in preparation for these games. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm of that age. When I hear the word agony, I think of that poor skier on the old ABC wide world of sports coming down that slalom and just wiping out. Every week they showed that poor guy and they said, and we think of the agony of defeat. But you know there is also an agony of victory. It's not easy to win. You have to pay the price to win. Let me tell you what determines your destiny. Desire alone does not determine your destiny. Direction alone does not determine your destiny. There's lots of people who have a strong desire and they got the right direction, but they're not succeeding. Determination determines destiny. And here in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul speaks of a runner who's made up his mind. He's going to do it. He's going to win. And a person who's going to be used of God, who wants to develop a discipline and a rule of life in their life, is a person who says, I'm going to move ahead. My mind is made up. My goals are fixed, and I will not quit. Have you come to that place in your life? Someone has said you can tell the size of a person's faith by what it takes to stop them. You know, I found out it doesn't take much to stop some people. I mean, some little thing goes wrong. Somebody looks at them the wrong way. Somebody says something that hurts their feelings, and they're ready to pout and shout and just throw everything out. But, friends, if you're going to develop discipline in your life, you're going to have to have a steadfast determination. I heard a good prayer some time ago that could help us in this area. The prayer goes like this, Lord, give me the the determination to keep going when I am doing your will even when it looks hopeless. Can you read that with me right now? Let's say it together. Lord, give me the determination to keep going when I'm doing your will, even when it looks hopeless. Are you that determined? Am I that determined? I often wonder. You see, listen to me. Hardships are going to come. Failures are going to come. Disappointments are bound to happen. There is no easy path to follow Jesus Christ. You see, one of my pet peeves with so much of the teaching and preaching that I hear on television or on the radio is that so often what I hear is someone promoting a shortcut to spirituality. They're trying to microwave maturity. That's not real. That's not biblical. 
Paul later writes in this same letter in 1 Corinthians 16, he says, a great door for effective work has opened to me and there are many who oppose me. Now that's real. That's life in this fallen world. That's the fulfillment of Jesus' words in John 16. When he said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. You've probably heard the name of Jerry Falwell. He was a well-known and outspoken pastor, often criticized in the media, of Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia. He passed away a few years back. Ran across this fascinating story. He was a freshman in his Bible college. And he went to a very small church, and he asked if they needed help with their youth. And they gave him a class to teach for 11-year-old boys that had one student, met in one little room, didn't have any walls, just curtains. Falwell taught that one student for one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Finally, that one student got so embarrassed being the only one in the class, he invited a friend, and Falwell taught the both of them for a little while. In frustration... Falwell went to the Sunday school superintendent after several weeks of teaching just these two boys. He said, you know what? This class just doesn't look like it's going to grow. Here's your enrollment book back. Here's your teacher's manual back. Maybe you ought to get somebody else. And that bold superintendent said to a young Jerry Falwell, you're probably right. You ought to give up this class. I knew better when I gave it to you to begin with. You didn't look like you were going to amount to much to me. You look like you'd be a quitter. And furthermore, I don't think you're ever going to make anything in the ministry. Jerry Falwell's eyes flashed with a fiery anger. He said, wait a minute. He said, give me that teacher's book back. Give me some time to pray about it. So he went to the dean of students at his college, and he asked for an empty dorm room. And he began spending afternoons there. We didn't have class in prayer. And he prayed. He said, God, I don't want to be a quitter. God, I want to amount to something for you. And he began to pray for the boys in his class and their friends. And that class started turning around. And soon... Other boys started coming. And then one of the boys accepted Jesus as Savior, and then another. And Falwell started going to the local parks on Saturday and inviting other 11-year-old boys to the class. And by the time the spring semester ended of his freshman year, 56 boys were attending that 11-year-old Sunday school class. Most of them had made a decision to receive Jesus as their Savior and Lord, and many of their parents had come to faith as well. You see, God taught Jerry Falwell at a young age a lesson about determination. Jesus said it like this in Luke 9, 62, any man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Now, some people read that to mean if you quit, you're not worthy of going to heaven. Listen to me, friends. No one is worthy of going to heaven no matter what you do or do not do. Going to heaven is not a matter of human attainment. It's a matter of Christ's atonement. Jesus is saying if you quit, you're not going to be useful in building his kingdom. It's not a matter of your salvation. It's a matter of your transformation. Part of developing discipline and being fit for kingdom purposes is having a steadfast determination that I will go forward for Jesus Christ. A strong desire, a sense of direction, a steadfast determination, and the fourth step is self-denial. Let me read verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 9 again. Paul writes, everyone who competes goes into strict training. The old King James translation says he is temperate in all things. Temperate means he has learned to say no to his fleshly desires. In other words, this is a person who is in control of his or her cravings. Now, some of you sitting here this morning, you're thinking to yourself, I'm in control of my cravings. My bodily desires don't boss me around. I say, okay, is that true? Let's prove it. You tell yourself tomorrow or the next day, or you pick any day this week that you're going to fast, that you will not eat any food just for that one day. Let's make it easier. Let's just say that you won't eat a meal or two meals for that one day. Now, medically, if you have a reason why you need to eat, by all means, don't try this, but I'm speaking to, to those of you who, who could try this. When you do, you'll quickly find out who's in control. Let me say this to you. Every time you pass the refrigerator, you will hear voices calling out to you. <laughs> you will hear the plea of pork. <laughs> You'll hear the murmuring of meat. You'll hear the voice of vanilla ice cream coming from the freezer. Your sense of smell of food will intensify. 
You will look at a magazine and your eyes will fixate on a food advertisement. You'll find your fingers caressing the outside of a potato chip bag package. <laughs> your ears will hear the sputtering grease of a frying hamburger a block away. Now, I'm not saying you should fast just to prove something to yourself, but all of us need to fast from time to time unless there's a health reason or you struggle with an eating disorder. From time to time, we should fast just to show our bodies who in, who's in control. We need to prove that we can say, no, you won't have anything to eat right now. No, you won't be pampered. You see, when we start talking about self-denial, we meet a lot of enemies in our flesh. The first enemy you very quickly meet is rationalization. The ability of the human mind to rationalize human behavior is amazing. We can find a good reason why we can't pray. We can find specific causes why we had to give up reading the Bible every day. We can pinpoint with great certainty why we had to stop tithing. And conversely, we can find a very compelling reason why we should have that second piece of pie or why we need to make that three easy pay plan purchase on the Home Shopping Network. Somebody pointed out that the word rational lies is really two words put together, rational lies. That's really what it is, isn't it? Another enemy that we meet is the word procrastination. There are so many people who continually say, one of these days I'm going to throw my cigarettes away. One of these days, I'm going to get serious about starting to exercise again. One of these days, I'm going to really get serious about fixing my woeful finances. A poet wrote these words, procrastination is my sin. It brings me nothing but sorrow. I know I should stop it. In fact, I will, and I will start tomorrow. <laughs> Another enemy that frequently appears in our flesh is distraction. You'll be doing the right things. You're on the right path. You're making healthy, wise choices. And then suddenly your attention is diverted by something that seems more urgent and you stop and you never seem to get started again. And you know what happens? The good becomes the enemy of the best. Let me give you a very important insight here. This is such an important insight. A life of faith would be simple if it were just a choice between good and bad. It's not. A maturing walk with God is a choice between what is good and what is better, and that makes it tough. You can do a lot of good things, friends, but there are so many better things that you could be doing. And the ability to make those decisions wisely is the difference between trying and training, between existing and excelling, between getting by and getting better. The reason we so often rationalize and procrastinate and get distracted is because of our emotions. So many of us live by our feelings. And if you're primarily governed by your emotions, you will never establish a rule of life that will allow you to grow upward and be more fruitful and productive. Psychologist Dr. William James said, immature people want to feel good before they do right. Mature people do right, then they feel good. Did you hear that? That is such an important statement. Immature people want to feel good, and then they do right. Mature people do the right thing, and then they feel good. Some people say, well, it's hypocritical if I act contrary to what I feel. No, that's called obedience. Hypocrisy is acting contrary to what you believe. Obedience is acting in accordance with God's will in spite of what you feel. There's a big difference. I want you to see something here as we close. The root word of discipline which not many of us like, is the word disciple, which all of us are called to be. The same steps that lead you to a life of discipline will lead you to be a transformed disciple, a strong desire to do God's will, a sense of godly direction that acts as your moral compass, a steadfast determination that you will not let go of the plow, you'll keep pushing forward, and a self-denial that lives by conviction and not by convenience. Friends, you can try harder to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You can hear sermon after sermon on a number of helpful topics, and you can go out week after week determined to do better, to try harder, and on Monday, you'll feel exhausted and you'll feel defeated. 
or you can train wisely by arranging your life around certain practices, a rule of life that will enable you to do what you cannot do now by your willpower alone. You can establish a rule of life that will sustain the life change that God wants to do in you and through you. Now, what's the payoff? Why should we do this? Throughout this section in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul points out that the athletes in the Ishmael games compete to win a prize. Do you know what the prize was these athletes received if they won the Ishmael games? A wreath, a wreath of oak leaves. That was it. They trained hard for 10 months to compete for 10 minutes, and they were rewarded with a handful of twigs and leaves twisted together. They did all that to receive what Paul calls a corruptible crown. But he says we enter into a life of training to receive an incorruptible crown, a crown that does not wither, that does not perish, that does not spoil, that does not fade away, and best of all, can never be taken away. I say sign me up to compete for that. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads? Lord, after studying through this topic about making changes that last, over these last few weeks, we realize that there are so many things in each of us that need to change. And God, you know we have tried in the past to change, but it hasn't stuck. Father God, I'd ask right now that you let this time be different. Help us to train wisely, to be godly and healthy, and not just to try harder. Show us even one small step that we can do right now that will allow our lives to be more centered on you and more loving toward others. And by faith, we will obey, trusting that even the smallest of changes will grow into powerful winds of the Holy Spirit, blowing through and overtaking all areas of our lives. And we thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen.